Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. It's a pleasure to see all of you here uh, on this webinar, Climate Change and Health in the Western Balkans, a webinar that is organized by HEAL, the Health and Environment Alliance, an alliance of over 90 member organizations from the health community working for better health through a healthy environment. My name is Anne Stauffer, and I'm the Deputy Director at HEAL. And I'm joined here this afternoon by my colleagues, Vladka Matkovic, Senior Policy Officer on Health and Energy, Serjan Kukolt, our consultant on health and energy in the Western Balkans, and our colleague Violeta Gorlievich, the health and climate change coordinator. Welcome to this webinar on climate change and health. It's actually the first time we're speaking about climate change as an issue on, in the Western Balkans with you as the audience. And we're very interested in hearing your thoughts and your questions. This webinar is the second webinar in a series organized by HEAL on climate, air quality, and health issues for the Western Balkans. With that series, we're responding to the increasing interest in the Western Balkans health sector on these matters, and also the need to share information and good practice on health engagement on climate and the green agenda for the Western Balkans with the international health community. The World Health Organization considers that climate change is the biggest threat to public health of the century and we're experiencing the effects of global heating everywhere in the European region. For example, right now with heat waves or violent thunderstorms. In 2020, Europe saw its warmest year on record at 1.6 degrees above the 1981 to 2010 reference periods and actually 0 0.4 um, Celsius degrees above 2019, which was previously the warmest year. And these changing climatic conditions threaten our health in many ways, and we will hear more about it in the course of this webinar. Regarding climate change, among policymakers and the public, there is a growing recognition that we need to act to tackle this issue. And with the landmark Paris Agreement, we have the policy framework just to do so. But it's very clear that the response to climate change needs to be with greater urgency. And we need to see a swift decarbonization by 2030. And also in this webinar, we'll talk further about what kind of policy change we need to see happening in the Western Balkans in the next decade. And personally, I have been pleased to see that more and more people from the health sector, from the health community, have engaged on climate issues. There is really very much a growing movement on climate and health. So I look forward to exchanging on how the Western Balkans health sector can be active. And I'm delighted that we can have that exchange with our very well experienced and knowledgeable speakers and US participants. Before we start, I wanted to announce some housekeeping rules. Number one, this is a webinar with simultaneous translation into English and Serbian. So if you go to the bottom of your screen and click on the interpretation icon, you can choose English for the translation into English and then French for the translation into Serbian. Unfortunately, there is no Serbian button available. If you have any questions or comments, and we really invite you to put your questions or comments, please use the Q&A box also at the bottom um, of your screen. We will be reviewing your questions. You can write them in English or in Serbian. It will not be possible to ask a question directly with the microphone. Uh, but we certainly will have time for any of your concerns at the end in our discussion part. This is a webinar that will be recorded and will be published afterwards on YouTube, so you can watch it again and also share it and recommend it with your colleagues and your network. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, for Serbian participants, please contact Serjan. You can see him in the participants list. And for English participants, please contact uh, Flatka or myself. And now um, I'm opening this webinar and I'm really delighted and to welcome our first speaker, which is Dr. Francis McGuire. Francis is policy manager at the Lancet Countdown on health and climate change. And she'll explain to us the Lancet Countdown in a minute. So I will not go into detail here, but say that Francis has a career, your career spans climate change research, policy, advocacy and education at local, national, international levels, working in academia and NGOs and the UK NHS. And you have a background in life sciences and public health. 
and we're really delighted to have you kick off this exchange and present to us the latest findings of the Lancet Countdown. Francis, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne. I will just share my screen. Uh, I hope that works. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Can see my screen. It and yes. Is it, is it in the right? It has the live block um, US cities uh, set up cooling centers. Yes, yeah. but is yeah. it the, um, yes, I think that's yeah. fine. Okay. Yes, we can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you very much, Han, and, and um, welcome to this webinar. I wanted to start here, actually, with this picture that came across my desk yesterday. Um, it's uh, from Reuters, and it appeared on ABC News from Australia. And it's a picture of a, uh, a cooling shelter in Portland, Oregon, where people are literally cooling down because of the current heat wave that is taking place right now. And I just thought it really encapsulated what we're trying to do within the Lancet Countdown and as many other health and climate change um, people, <laughs> uh, members of the health and climate change community are, are, are trying to do, which is to highlight the impacts of climate change on health, what it means for health services, what it means for people, what it means um, for academics trying to research impacts and, and risks, what it means for policymakers. I feel like it's kind of all in that picture and we'll unpack that in the next 10 minutes and hopefully in the rest of the webinar. If this works, which I'm not 100% sure it's going to. Have you got the next? Uh, no, it's not going to the next one. No, unfortunately not. Um... Wonder why that is. Oh yeah, that yes. Here, here we are. Yeah. Okay. So, as I mentioned, I'm the uh, policy engagement engagement manager at the Lancet Countdown. Lancet Countdown has been producing an annual report um, on the issue of health and climate change for the last five years. Uh, hopefully, some of you will have, will recognise some of these pictures. We um, work on this report for the bulk of the year, um, but not that's not all we do. But this is our key output and uh, we aim to release it a little bit before the United Nations COP meetings so as to uh, uh, bring information um, and emphasis to, um, to the agenda at COP on health and climate change. We work with at least 38 partners around the world, there are quite possibly more now, um, academics and, and people involved in policy uh, in WHO and um, uh, the World Meteorological, Meteorological Organization, all reflected there. Our initial focus obviously is on um, climate change impacts, exposures and vulnerability. And, and Anna asked me to just sort of cover this briefly, which I will be really brief. This diagram is sort of simpler than it looks. The arrows make it look a little bit confusing. But essentially with climate change impacts, it's all to do with how will the climate changes that are predicted um, affect people. So we're looking at changes in temperature and heat waves, we're looking at uh, changes in precip precipitation, so that might lead to floods or it might lead to droughts. Uh, there are changes in uh, the, the ranges of infectious diseases um, and vectors, so mosquitoes that, will that could transmit malaria or dengue fever. And of course any changes in uh, temperature and precipitation and wildfires can also have knock-on effects to agriculture and food security. And then there are more knock-on effects to uh, the livability of certain environments and where people are now living at the margins, which may force people to move, and then that will drive migration and displacement. And on top of all that, we also have rising sea levels um, from uh, both the expansion of the oceans because of warming, but also melting from glaciers and ice caps. And that leads both to flooding and coastal erosion, and in the long term, very significant problems, um, which it's best to talk to the IPCC about. So within the Lancet Countdown, we look at a whole series of indicators to try and track um, the impacts of climate change on human health. And we um, start with those impacts that I've just flagged really. And we have uh, five working groups. The first looks at the impacts, the second looks at adaptation. So how can we prepare for impacts that we can't avoid. So for example, there's a certain amount of sea level rise we already can't avoid. So we're already seeing coastal erosion and flooding in coastal areas and saline intrusion. 
How do we adapt to those situations? That's adaptation. How do we prepare for it now and in the next decades? Those impacts we are already seeing. Then the second group looks at um, mitigation. How do we actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by switching to renewable energy, uh, active travel, um, city planning, and a whole uh, bunch of other interventions? The third looks at, um, that actually might have been the third. Anyway, that was the third. And then the fourth and fifth look at um, the economic and political context and how to communicate that. So we have all this set of indicators and we update them annually to see what's happening year on year and report on that at the end of the year. The research is obviously a huge part of what we're doing, actually tracking the research and the indicators and interpreting what it means. But we, are, we integrate with that research, what that means for policymakers, how to engage with policymakers, and how to communicate the findings in the report. So we have a whole suite of activities that are tied up around um, the launch of the report, including, including the production of policy briefings, which is really my area, and, um, and also different uh, communications techniques, whether that's roundtables, webinars, infographics, social media, uh, mainstream media, um, the whole lot really. So looking at the 2020 report, um, which obviously is online, so you can dig into it more deeply. If you find it uh, too much to handle, then um, look at the policy briefings, which will give you country specific information. We don't have one for the Western Balkans. We did have some data. We do have some data on urban green space, um, and that's something uh, to look out for, perhaps um, down the track. Um, but for the 2020 report, we had 43 indicators and some new ones, uh, which included heat related mortality, uh, net carbon pricing, health benefits of low carbon diets. I can't go into all these right now. We, we literally don't have the time in 10 minutes. So I'm just going to flag those and you can always get in touch if you want to know a little bit more about them or, as I say, dig into the report on the website. Um, but we released the report, obviously, at a very uh, serious and significant time in our current, um, if you like, history, but also present. We were, we were between phase one and phase two. Um, that's not really the right word, is it? Not phase one and phase two. Um, peak, the, the peaks of the pandemic, the second peak. We didn't know what was coming really in, in the new year. Uh, and we've been through even more than I think we anticipated uh, in the last few months, certainly in the UK and in India and in Brazil and the US and in many other countries. So our report, was one of many serious issues that people were having to encounter. And the main point we made at the time was that as we come out of, of the COVID pandemic, we have to align our response to climate change um, with a green recovery, with a healthy recovery, um, which supports the Paris Agreement. So I'll just dip into a couple of the indicators, probably the key one uh, for this audience today. Would be the work we've done on heat related mortality showing here that the the countries which are are showing the most impact are the regions um the united states uh china uh, japan uh india um central europe uh and that these are the impacts we're seeing now um and obviously we can anticipate with ipcc projections that this will get worse unless we um, act quickly and decisively and uh, in a way that actually has, a, has an impact. Um, as I mentioned, we have a second group that works on adaptation. And so one of the indicators showed that of the 50% of the countries that we surveyed, uh, had, or 50% of the countries that we surveyed had adaptation plans, but only 9% of them had sufficient funding to. Um, implement those plans and that's a really important point that not only most or, or you know half of the countries we surveyed not even got plans but of those that have got plans they can't implement them and that's a key message through the policymakers and something to start working on to both make sure countries have got adaptation plans and the funding to actually implement them effectively um, this one on employment i thought was just an interesting one given um, the region we're in uh, we found that renewable energy provided 11.5 million jobs in 2019, and that was a 4.5% rise from 2018, which is great news. Um, 
and we found a 3% decline uh, in, in fossil fuel extraction from 2018 to 2019. But if you look at that graph and think about what it means, all the coloured boxes are the, the, the increase in renewables, which is really, really good news. All the, the blue bar underneath is, is fossil fuel extraction. Now, we have to shift out of coal if we're going to tackle climate change and hit a 1.5 degrees C limit. We've got to shift out fast. We've got to shift out decisively. We've got to leave and move into renewables quickly. But that involves a lot of people's lives and livelihoods, jobs. And we've got to do this in a way that is a fair transition, a, a just transition from the energy that we've all been dependent upon for the last 250 odd years, uh, certainly in the industrial world, um, into uh, a clean energy future that protects jobs and lives and livelihoods. Not an easy challenge, especially in the uh, context of COVID. And the fifth group that we have working, as I mentioned, is public and political engagement. And we have five key indicators there just listed. And to just bring out a, a, a highlight there, that between 2007 and um, 2019, the uh, original search on health and climate change increased by a factor of eight, which is really uh, good news. Um, mainly driven by research scientists in high income countries. And so Lancet Countdown is um, uh, working with collaborators in uh, small island developing states out of uh, the Caribbean, um, but also in China and also in West Africa to start to try and build uh, the research capacity on health and climate change in low and middle income countries. So the report finished with this statement, really. Uh, 2020 Lancet Countdown report reveals the worst outlook for public health since inception. So um, it was a bit bleak and we were in a very bleak time and we're still in a challenging time without doubt. Um, no country is immune from the health impacts of climate change in much the same way that no country is immune from the health impacts of the COVID pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, People talked a bit about, or I saw this in a few places, that we were, we were all in the same storm. You know, we all had to kind of work together and we would solve, solve the pandemic and come through. And then people realized that actually, we might have been in the same storm, but we were in different boats. And, and so some people were uh, at more risk, more vulnerable to the impacts of the pandemic than others. And we, we've identified huge inequalities in terms of where people live, uh, urban versus rural, areas that have got uh, poor air quality versus clean air quality, whether you can access a vaccine or you can't access a vaccine, whether there was PPE, uh, all of the issues that have emerged. With climate change, I feel it's a little bit different. We're, we're sort of in the same, we're in, we're, in, we're in different storms. We might be affected by wildfires, we might be affected by floods, we might be affected by coastal erosion, we might be affected by the loss of ice that affects our our uh, identity as, as, a, as, as people dependent, as indigenous people dependent upon ice. Um, so different storms, but the same boat. We are all in the same boat, and that is this planet that we're dependent upon for our life, lives and our livelihoods. And we're at a point where we have got to act fast and decisively and with focus. Um, I've worked on climate change since 1989. Since that time, the science has really come in with very confident in science. The policies have come in, we know what we need to do. The public understanding is much, much higher ever since the youth strikes. And I think that what the youth strikes did for, for raising public awareness around the world about climate change has been absolutely enormous. It's been wonderful and fantastic. And um, we even have a degree of political support. We've got the Paris Agreement. What we are in danger of running out of is time. We have got to act now, we've got to focus. We've got this decade, according to the IPCC, to really channel our activities to make sure, not that we solve it all in the next decade, but that we set ourselves off in the right direction. And that means getting out of fossil fuels and getting into renewable energy, sustainable agriculture and sustainable development. So I'm gonna leave you with a little challenge um, during the rest of the webinar, which is have a think about what where you think the focus should be in these next eight, nine years to really drive us through in much the same way as we responded to the pandemic by saying we need a vaccine. 
we need treatments, we need PPE, and we need public communication so that people understand social distancing and they understand why we need a vaccine and how a vaccine works. Where do we focus in the next eight years to get us to where we need to be by 2030? Thank you for listening and do put those in the Q&A. Wonderful, thank you very much, Francis, for this overview and snapshot uh, of the Lancet countdown. And as you mentioned, there is, there is a wealth of information and data available. So I invite all of you um, to have a look. I will also share the, uh, the link to the Lancet countdown here, um, here in the chat. Um, and I think it, these, you know, um, this collecting this information and, and bringing them out has been, has been so important. And certainly for, for our organization for HEAL, last year's finding that uh, Europe is the most uh, vulnerable actually of all regions in the world when it comes to the heat related impacts, uh, you know, should have certainly put us on red alert. And I think should also put many policymakers on red alert. And in your presentation, you have already started to uh, highlight some of the policy discussions that come, uh, you know, with the understanding on how climate change threaten our health and certainly about the, the urgency to act, which is the perfect link to our next speaker. And I'm pleased to welcome Daniela Bosanovic. You're, Daniela is a climate change expert, and she has a background in meteorology with 20 years of experience in climate and climate change. For more than 10 years, Daniela was the head of the Climate Change Unit in the Ministry in charge for the environment and climate change. And she's experienced in the preparation of national reports of planning in compliance with the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement and the EU, and also very experienced in co cooperating with these and other organizations, as well as with national stakeholders. And we're really pleased to have you here this afternoon and to learn more from you about the policy framework on climate change in the Western Balkans region, and uh, most importantly, your assessment on how policymakers are actually taking up the challenge of climate change. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, I will, I will uh, share the presentation. I hope you, you can see it. So just... Yes, we can see it. Okay. So, uh, just a second to try to, okay. And you will be switching to speaking in Serbian, right? Or yes, speak in as, as a native Serbian speaker, yep. I, I feel <laughs> more comfortable to, to speak into, into Serbian. So I will continue in Serbian. I, I apologize for that, but luckily there is a, there is a translation. So uh, everything will be, will be fine. So, uh, uh, so as uh, already mentioned, the point of my presentation will be to try and uh, tell you where we are as a region in terms of uh, climate action and generally uh, to tell you about these policies. So basically, where the Western Balkan is, it's very important to think about where the world is going, actually. So what the previous uh, speaker already mentioned, the Paris uh, uh, agreement uh, also with the UNFCCC uh, somehow um, is uh, showing us the direction if you want to be carbon neutral uh, we need to do this by the end of uh, this year so that we could uh, actually uh, try to live in the way that we used to live before so uh, the Paris agreement uh, determined the way uh, or the goals in terms of climate protection, it defined what uh, really is the, the issue of ethics uh, and uh, uh, responsibility. But on the other hand, if you look at the trends in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, some development and research, uh, what is also uh, mentioned by the previous speaker, uh, it is clear that uh, we have a new industrial revolution uh, going on. How important it is, apart from uh, what it represents the ethics, uh, you can see from the fact that the main uh, um, uh, providers of these emissions have defined their target years when they are going to reach carbon neutrality and European Union 
uh, is important for the region because uh, more or less all the countries of the Western Balkans are the candidates or potential candidates for the membership in the EU. So we should uh, simply uh, expect uh, for the Western Balkans to be in compliance uh, with the goals of the European Union. So I'm not going to read from the slide, but it's clear that China and the USA are, especially the USA, with uh, the Biden administration, are quite ambitious, especially in terms of energy sector. As for China, when you take a look at the development of China, uh, it's clear that what's happening in the Western Balkans, when we talk about Chinese uh, technologies, is not what's happening in China in the last years. So it's not about Chinese technology, but how you perceive and what you're allowing uh, uh, to have here. Um, when it comes to the carbon neutrality, I wanted to explain that carbon neutrality is not that complete emissions and is zero, but that carbon neutrality that we are searching until 2050 is that what uh, we are um, emissioning uh, in the sector of uh, waste, uh, transport, agriculture is the same as what will be absorbed by forests and oceans so that the, uh, the, the com all of that which is eliminated through uh, forests is zero. Uh, it is also very important and it, it has been presented wrongly in the countries of the Western Balkans, uh, whether because of bad knowledge or uh, of malintent, is that um, it is being insisted that the climate uh, neutrality, carbon neutrality will give us the problem with energy supply and that some um, workers will become uh, jobless. But that is not true. The whole concept of um, energy um, efficiency uh, is a, ju a just transition plan, a socioeconomic uh, right transition, which means that all of those workers from uh, the sectors which have to do with the energy production from coal, they will be moved to sectors which will contribute to the energy pr production, uh, but in another way. So I am always thinking from the perspective of uh, mining workers, and it is uh, very difficult for me to understand that somebody would like more to work in a mine than in the production of solar uh, panels. Why is the carbon neutrality important until 2050? Adaptation uh, is uh, possible to be achieved in a way that the world remains very similar to the two days um, way. Um, is if we achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. So if it is whether it will be possible to adapt um, the sectors and which part of the world, that is not certain. The, if there is no carbon neutrality, then it is not really certain that we will be able to adapt. So that is my uh, personal um a frustration that the uh, um, those gases, pollution gases, are not the same as the one uh, of uh, pollution. The the, the the those gases have the uh, biggest potential of pollution, but that uh, also doesn't mean that the reduction of emission of um, gases does not contribute to the reduction of pollution gases. A good example of that are uh, thermal uh, power plants, which are 
uh, reducing emission into the air and the influence upon the climate change. Why is it important to have decarbonization and carbon neutrality and uh, the fight against climate change? Just like I have said, next to the um, emissions of pollutants, all of the sectors which are uh, contributing to the global uh, warming, uh, they are um, uh, leading to pollution, uh, the combustion of fuels, there are emissions into all um, natural resources. Uh, polluted air and uh, soil and uh, water, it influences all areas of life. Uh, through heat waves, uh, floods, uh, and it is also a huge negative impact uh, to the sector of health and uh, our indirect influences through pollution and the lack of water and food. So the health uh, care system and the planning of decarbonization without um, uh, taking into consideration the health aspect is again an avoidance of one of very important drivers and explanations why we have to tackle climate change if there are no other elements. So. Uh, reports for the EU shows that the healthcare systems are uh, losing 390 to 940 billion euros per year. So imagine when you have an impact of climate change, then uh, there is an increased pollution of air, water and soil. And very often we can hear, I heard that in the media recently, uh, where does the pollution come uh, today? Uh, come from today in Sarajevo? Uh, so maybe because of the climate change, because everything that happened earlier, which went to the higher areas of, of the air, uh, it wasn't visible, but now it is increased. The frequency of all of those pollutions is increasing, especially when it comes to the air. What was done for Serbia is a socioeconomic analysis which has uh, dealt with the um, impact of the climate change to the costs of the healthcare system. And there was the basic scenario, baseline scenario without adaptation, which has shown the following. They dealt uh, with additional costs for the healthcare system of Serbia. These are the numbers which are uh, showing in a billion dollars uh, additional costs, what the healthcare system already has in costs, these are additional costs only because of the raise of temperature on the global level. So these, um, this is what the agreement from Paris is requesting and these are the costs for Serbia if it doesn't adapt. This can be a good starting point and a good foundation for fundraising but it has to be important to somebody on the other side the draft strategy of climate change or low carbon development of serbia for the period until 2050 According to the draft from 2018, this draft is one of the seldom documents, which uh, one of the rare documents that have considered the aspect of health. It was asked to determine an additional influence upon the health or additional benefit for the health if something is done in the sense of the greenhouse gases emissions. I have to say that this strategy foresees a reduction of 33% in a um, acceptable scenario, air to scenario until 2030 and 65 to 76% of reduction of 
uh, greenhouse gases until 2050 compared to 1990. So these are the numbers without uh, forests. So in case you have a small attempt to reduce emission less than 33%, in Serbia, there is a number of avoided death cases until 2050 of 2,574. If um, you have a percentage near 33%, the avoided deaths are 27,753. It is really a wonder to me that this is not an important, considered an important information for the government in Serbia. Uh, there is probably a reason why they don't consider it important. It is very important and interesting why it is important for a part of Western Balkans to, to tackle this. Uh, whole Europe, Western Balkans and Serbia have information which show that Serbia, uh, that Serbia is being heated 2.5 times faster than global warming. So I think that the floods in 2014 and the floods every year, which happen in Kraljevo, in Pirot, uh, these are the floods that we don't know about. And the drafts, uh, uh, which happen in November, for instance, when there is no time for them. So these are parameters for everybody who is dealing with the environment. It is clear that something is not right, but the Serbs would say, I dare um, say that. I suppose that's, that's a general approach uh, that uh, problems are never coming alone. It is God's will. And then uh, they just think, uh, uh, think that uh, or hope that it will not happen. But the essence is that for these things, there is a solution. There is a way to really, if not completely eliminate uh, the floods and drafts and losses in agriculture, but so if not to eliminate them completely, but then to keep them in really on small levels. From the aspect of why it is important for the countries of the Western Balkans, uh, if we want to become members of the EU, um, if that is the position of the people of Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, if we want to be members, the European Union has their goals. They said in 2050, they will be carbon neutral. And in 2030, they will have a reduction of emissions by 55% on the level of the EU. It doesn't mean that every country will be able to reduce by 55%. That's why Europe is a good organization or association because it is researching its possibilities and finding optimal uh, measures um, for its uh, member states to help them. In its Green Deal, European Union uh, is defining these goals until 2050 and 2030. It has also defined mechanisms of cooperation with partner countries of the Western Balkans. <clears throat> they have also defined a declaration from Sofia signed with the countries of the Western Balkans last year. Uh, it was signed by prime ministers of the West Balkan countries. Uh, based on that, the economic and financial plan for the West the Balkans um, uh, and should help the countries of the Western Balkans to remain on the way to the goals of the European Union. So it is easy. Western Balkans is now in the situation to be participant uh, of this revolution or a loser. So it is... Um, on the governments um, in this region to decide on which uh, which side we will want to be part of. What can be another argument for the countries of the Western Balkans to be 
the participant and not the loser. The carbon taxes of the EU. The EU has, has said that it will introduce a carbon tax uh, to uh, for steel, cement, chemical, is artificial fertilizers. After that, it will be spread on all other products, not because the European Union has something against these products, but because the European Union has a goal. It is defined with the EU Green uh, Deal because it, it imports one ton of CO2 with products and values from uh, abroad and because the EU wants to uh, in uh, to secure its um, economies. It is not expected for the economy of the EU to invest into the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions and then to allow products which will be competitive and produce a huge carbon footprint. If I could ask you to wrap up, please, Daniela, your presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So where we have Northern Macedonia that is following mostly the goals, it has done a lot. They have NDCs, which was expected from the Paris Agreement. Bosnia and Herzegovina did that uh, recently. Montenegro did that. Unfortunately, one of the uh, none of the countries doesn't have the same as um, uh, the EU. Albania as well. So basically, they have their own. Uh, law on climate change, but it does not uh, involve the, as a goal, uh, the reduction of uh, greenhouse gases. And what's also interesting, uh, that is the, uh, they have to uh, submit their integrated climate change uh, um, uh, plan. Only Northern Macedonia has actually did uh, that. Uh, that is very strange. Uh, there shouldn't be a big difference between the integrated plan for climate and energy and the NDCs, which is uh, submitted uh, according to the convention or the agreement on, in Paris. So wh where was the problem? We don't know. Uh, that's all from me. And I'm open for all the opinions to see where the problem is. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniela, for this presentation on the many policy opportunities there are in the different frameworks. Uh, and then, yeah, also showing us the, the uh, huge uh, health economic costs that we're already seeing from pollution uh, and from climate change in the country. And I think definitely a lot more to talk about, uh, you know, as part of the discussion on where, where the attention should be. Uh, and yeah, if, you know, how we can get policymakers to, to step up and be more ambitious. Uh, and I wanted to remind all participants um, of Francis' question and asking you know, what, what do you think needs to happen by 2030 uh, for us to, to better protect health from climate change? Is it that all uh, coal power plants need to be closed? Should we all you know, um, you know, walk and cycle more in our cities? Uh, is it that we need a Lancet countdown for the Western Balkans each year? Please. Send your uh, comments and ideas uh, in the Q&A. And with that, I would like to turn to our last but not least speaker, which is Professor Dr. Maria Jeftic. Maria is a full professor at the University of Novi Sad at the Medical Fac Faculty and a specialist in hygiene at the Institute of Public Health of Vojvodina. And Maria, you're wearing many hats, including you're also a scientific collaborator at the University Libre de Bruxelles. You're an EU Climate Pact Ambassador for Serbia, and you're also the President of the Environment and Health Section of the European Public Health Association's UFA, the European Network of Public Health Specialists. Uh, and we have been working together for a long time with you on raising awareness um, on climate change and health on air pollution. And I'm pleased to have you here this afternoon to hear from you from your work and perspective on climate change and health in Serbia and health engagement. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anne. I will share my screen and I will switch to Serbian. 
uh, I hope you can see and uh, hear me. Uh, good day to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone for the invitation to take part at this webinar or the series of webinars organized by HEAL. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, Anne, Vladka, Sergen uh, for all their efforts uh, that they are uh, investing in our region in terms of uh, uh, climate change, uh, pollution, uh, public health, and so on. Uh, today, I will be talking, uh, reflecting on the Western Balkans. And I will also uh, mention the Green Deal and climate impact. And I will try to explain why it is important today, because until recently, I was at a climate uh, pact day of action, which is an important uh, event uh, that has different initiatives regarding the uh, adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Uh, we have already seen similar uh, slides like this one. I would like to thank Francis and uh, Daniela for uh, making it harder for me because of that and also uh, allowing me to reflect on their presentation. So I won't be talking about this uh, for too long. It's clear that the uh, factory of climate change is uh, intensively working, but that intensity is not uh, the same in all uh, parts of our planet. Regional Cooperation Council uh, has published in 2018 uh, a study on climate change in the Western Balkans, and they uh, warned us uh, that uh, there is going to be an increase in temperature in the Western Balkans, uh, 1.7 to 4% Celsius, depending on how we behave. And that is uh, the reflection of what uh, Daniela just mentioned, and that is that we definitely uh, can choose a better path and we have the opportunity to do so. I belong to this generation that in the 60s, uh, uh, that remembers uh, this switch from one season to another, this uh, clear boundary uh, and uh, between uh, the seasons. So I think that uh, our generation, new generation of children, learn uh, about these things from uh, textbooks. So basically they belong to this generation that will not uh, ever find out what it means to have a clear uh, passage from uh, uh, spring to uh, summer and from fall to winter. And this climate change is brought on an individual level, clear indicators uh, that can have a uh, great importance for the quality of life and health. As Daniela said, I have one slide uh, talking about uh, the disasters in the Balkans and that it never comes alone. Uh, this is a clinical picture of climate change in the Balkans. It is more intense maybe than somewhere else. And we are vulnerable and more vulnerable and our resilience is smaller because there are different reasons actually, but one of them is because we are less organized. We have a lack of systematic monitoring, uh, insufficient evidence-based uh, compliance with some procedures and so on. But anyway, we cannot uh, from this present moment, uh, uh, skip the pandemic. Uh, so I think that as someone who is coming from the health sector, I have to emphasize this. And I have to say that the Western Balkans, apart from uh, being exposed to the symptoms of uh, uh, floods and droughts as the consequences of uh, uh, climate change and these heat waves, uh, that is also burdening the health systems. Now we also have the COVID crisis. So I would just like to say that people uh, are really affected. I mean, this doesn't last long, this COVID crisis, if you take a look at the, the entire uh, humanity. And some people 
uh, when they talk about COVID uh, pandemic, they use the past tense, but we are still in the COVID pandemic. Some people are also mentioning the fourth wave uh, during the, uh, the autumn, but actually we have actually, uh, we are not talking about this huge climate wave, not as a wave that's going to pass by us, but we are already there and this is the very uh, this is going to be a very warm period for all of us it's going to require a serious industrial revolution and it requires our adaptation and our choices individual and population choices will have to go in that direction uh, in the same uh, regional cooperation council's report we have mentioned uh, the fourth, uh, fourth sector that are most affected by climate change. They say agriculture, forestry, water resources, and human health. But I would also like to mention that uh, human health in more narrow sense means uh, resilience to these heat waves and so on. And this direct uh, impact is one thing, but a sustainable agriculture and fight for uh, the uh, forest. I know that Vojvodina uh, has the least uh, 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 forest in Europe, but after 100 years, uh, the other day in Serbia uh, brought about the water restrictions. So, because it was the hottest day in the last uh, uh, 100 years uh, in uh, June. So we are always as experts telling you that you have to hydrate and you have to give your uh, pets enough water. We need to have enough uh, uh, green spaces. But through our urban planning, we uh, created a huge disproportion between the uh, 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 surfaces that are under concrete and those that are under greenery. So our cities are suffering because of the heat because of that. and that shouldn't have happened. And we should bear in mind both direct and indirect impacts on human health. So global challenges are uh, numerous and large, but I would like to uh, focus on an environment and I would like to mention the uh, globalization, uh, this uh, economy, uh, consumption society, other socioeconomic events in the Balkans that are somehow leading us into regression uh, compared to how we are supposed to develop as humans. And that is why I'm going to quote our big uh, philosopher, uh, famous not only in the Balkan, he was the ambassador of uh, Yugoslavia, and he said that um, as soon as uh, uh, the man became aware of his power, he began to treat nature as some random and unbearable oddity in the structured order of artificial things in the world of his own products, which would otherwise without nature be perfect. So we started building our own world by underestimating the nature and putting it aside. So it is... Uh, uh, it is uh, striking back uh, with floods and uh, winds and droughts. And where is this happening? Everywhere, to everyone. It's a global thing. But as Daniela said, and as we heard in the first presentation by Francis, the Western Balkans is a geographical area that is more vulnerable compared to others. So these climate changes are more uh, conspicuous here and more intense. So I would just like to mention that the health systems are those that recognize the externalities due to climate changes. So the increased uh, demands for uh, health services because of the human, because of the climate changes, but there's also the responsibility of the emission of greenhouse gases uh, in a considerable percentage. So we are both at the same time, actually a patient and a doctor in case of these uh, climate changes. So the Green Deal was mentioned. I'm not going to elaborate more on that, but I was just going to say that uh, sustainable recovery is uh, the basis of Green Deal. So we have to admit that we are uh, ill because of something and that the climate change is an illness uh, to our planet. And on the other hand, Green Deal 
says not only top down but bottom up as well bottom up means in our case that i'm coming from the academia so first of all there is the importance of education and uh, uh, long lasting uh, uh, education so throughout the life so european bauhaus a movement that can contribute to better hygiene of uh, housing uh, better um, uh, new choices actually and um, of course uh, there should be also this link with uh, uh, art and more sustainable and more quality living in urban areas so one of the solutions possible of course with all other uh, things is education and i'm going to uh, speak about some uh, uh, efforts in uh, the health sector so there is this uh, change in uh, the approach of education and the existence of some important content uh, throughout life uh, above all i'm talking about uh, the fact that we should not neglect the education of a health professional so that we could be functional uh, in formulating our uh, legal requirements for monitoring because everything that we are doing we are still talking at the level of individual uh, surveys and not systematic monitoring of consequences a green agenda for the western balkans will probably be a subject of one of the, the later webinars but i would like to say that it is a framework framework for our curricula and for the work with health professionals the, the future hospitals for instance should be directed at the circular uh, economy and decarbonization i'm saying that as one of the examples and the green agenda for the western balkans that daniela mentioned uh, includes the energy transformation circular economy uh, uh, bell for better quality air sustainable agriculture and protection of biodiversity uh, we know that the biodiversity is uh, jeopardized and that is an indicator of uh, the jeopard uh, of uh, endangerment of the health of the person of uh, people uh, to show what we are doing within uh, the region and within the european uh, week of public health uh, we had several seminars uh, with different sectors and with different perspectives on, on the climate change. And uh, just like today, I will mention, um, so just like today, we were also there only women, so the gender issue in climate change, that's an interesting topic when it comes to the consequences and the activities. I also wanted to show you a few examples of how we are working within the education of health professionals in trying to increase their um, awareness. We have also some positive examples of young people who are directed to uh, connect public health and clinical and who want to uh, to do research in that area that is very important to us and it is important that we can thus start changing some things efficiently uh, but to not only um, uh, talk about the academia and uh, the decision makers we think it is also very important to work on the micro level and that is the message of the today's climate pact 
uh, action, what we can do individually in our home, in our building, in our neighborhood, everybody can do something and lead by example its environment. So this situation with the pandemic has brought us maybe a small uh, a win, uh, less travel, it, can, it has uh, brought a um, decrease of greenhouse gases emission, and that will also be an opportunity for the future and for future corporations, uh, organization of conferences and communications. And then um, for the end, we have to know that the Western Balkans is an area of increased sensitivity, and that is why we need um, policies, as Daniela said, things that are um, uh, being neglected and, we, uh, that, and which we need to use. Education has to be, and training has to be constant um, in all uh, policy areas improvement of um, records in the healthcare sector uh, is the key and it has uh, to uh, be in line with the um, uh, legislation. The role of everybody has to be there. We uh, mustn't say that somebody else will do that. Everybody has to do it himself, thinking uh, on our children, because the future, gen future generations will not survive if we don't do uh, something now. And that is why it is important to accept that if um, climate change doesn't uh, accept the borders and the green agenda is an opportunity to uh, join the European Union faster and more efficiently. And we have to see that as a possibility through the uh, formation of the energy sector uh, with the respect of the law. It is important for me to say in the end that we would be a lot better and cleaner if only 50% uh, if we would respect our laws that we already have by 50% more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for this uh, intervention and highlighting again yeah, some of the, the issues that are at stake and the, the importance of education of, of you know, the health professionals, but I think also on you know, the public in general and, and policymakers. We're now moving to our discussion. I don't see any comments yet, but please put anything you want to speak about here this afternoon um, for this um, part of the webinar um, in the Q&A. Um, and as we're waiting to see and inviting people, I wanted to start with uh, a couple of questions as we had three very rich presentations. And my question, I think, especially to you, Daniela and Maria, would be about the the level of awareness because I think any action you know on climate uh, you know needs to have uh, the kind of awareness uh, the recognition in the beginning. So I wondered, uh, and I'm prompted by this by what Francis showed in when Western Europe how the how the media coverage has increased on climate and health, but it's still not very uh, way not enough. <laughs> I can tell you from from my experience. So how is you know how is the media coverage specifically on health? links of climate change and, and how, how much is the public aware that, you know, uh, what is what they're currently experiencing with, with heat waves is, is connected to climate change and, and or policymakers, yes, you know, how much do they take the, the issue of climate change seriously? Daniela? <laughs> Daniela first. Fact, uh, it looks like uh, if they need, if they have some kind of space not covered with other quite interesting material, they will, you know, uh, call some kind of experts or, or institutions to speak about environment and the climate change. Uh, uh, you could find in media only if some kind of event organized by the ministry or some UN agency has been happening, you know, unfortunately. So it's more like accident than, than you know, some kind of, of real 
uh, uh, covering the topic, unfortunately. And with media, I, I, you know, I, I really don't see almost any kind of change in a positive way, to be honest. When it comes to, to general public and especially NGOs, there is a change in positive way. There is certain improvement uh, for the last, I don't know how many, 10 or 15 years. But it's so slow, and you have a lot of those, you know, NGOs that has been working on everything which is environmental related, you know. And depending on the, the currently fancy topic, they start to cover air quality, waste, climate change, etc. There is a few of those that, as a matter of fact, try, you know, to follow. And when it comes to public uh, uh, in general, I, I unfortunately, I do not see a huge change, to be honest, you know. So there are a certain number of pe people or networks of people that has been doing in the field. But in general, you know, it's more like, it's more like uh, God willingness than climate change, you know, for, for the most of the, 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 the people in Serbia. So, so, um, that is that is my impression, you know. So maybe maybe Maria has because she she has been working more also with the uh, with the scientific uh, uh, people how that looks in that that sense. And maybe she she looks differently. But unfortunately, I'm not so so impressed with with improvement uh, when it comes to to, to awareness. Maria, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ok, ako, uh, ako mogu sada... Ove, so ja if you allow me, I would like to add, well, when it comes to the media, um, I think that the, the media are manipulating the a feeling of fear when it comes to the climate change. And when it comes to floods, droughts, uh, and they are not dealing with opportunities that we should use. And uh, they are not um, used for education sufficiently. And uh, as you well know, uh, Daniela and I are also personally uh, trying to really use expert capacities in order to be present in the media and to respond to the media when they have questions um, and that happens um, but it is a matter of how understandable it is uh, uh, what uh, what the media published um, how understandable it is the media should be used a lot more for a process of education or increase of the awareness of the citizens and having uh, now also this experience climate pack day of action uh, we saw how we can use the social media and other opportunities to um, stimulate the citizens to do something. I would like to say that in Serbia and in the Western Balkans region, uh, associations of citizens are being empowered who are uh, dedicated to the problems of the environment, health and climate change. And in any case, from the point of view of the experts, I can say that we will all, um, all of us who are active in different fields uh, connected to the climate change, that we will all um, make an effort to be there for the cooperation and to work together with the movements of citizens who are working on improving our, uh, on contributing to a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I think connected to that, uh, we've we've received a question, and that is about early warning systems. Early warning systems as a as a really necessary tool to protect our health, but I think also to to make people aware that there is a problem that needs you know a, a political answer. And the question is if if there are any um, early warning systems in place, 
uh, in the Western Balkans, or what you know, what kind of improvements are needed when it comes to yeah to to surveillance and and to alerts and uh, you know monitoring uh, the threats. Thanks, Maria. Is that something for you to respond? Can you repeat, please? If there are um, early warning systems on climate change, on the on the effects of climate change, or you know, on 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 heat heat waves, uh, these kind of things. Mm. Mm, but, uh, I would like uh, to use this opportunity to uh, welcome all of the listeners. I don't know whether. Somebody is here from the National Institute for Public Health, Batut, but that institute is uh, the authority which worked on informing citizens and to publish that on the website according to the law and the protection and health at work. It is important to follow the rule about a limited uh, time of um, working on high temperatures. And that is especially important for certain um, areas of work um, uh, when it comes to the actual events in Serbia. I think that we all know that we have very high temperatures at the moment. Uh, very difficult uh, weather and according to that there are also some problems in water supply so the system of um, warning is important but it is also important to be individually ready and to uh, be informed about all of that. And that is what has to be done, not only during this heat wave, but also in continuity. And I think that that has to be um, um, mentioned. So the Institution for Hydrometeorology is giving uh, warnings when it comes to high temperature, there are um, these uh, uh, yellow alarm, orange alarm, and so on for high temperatures. And as Maria said, uh, there is this information exchange between the Hydrometeorological Institute and the Institute, Healthcare Institute uh, Batut, and they are uh, warning the people how to react in these situations. And I think that that, that is an area where uh, we that we can hear about in the media, but the warning uh, to drafts, uh, there we can uh, see uh, one part on TV for Vojvodina, but for the rest of Serbia, no, not uh, on TV and in the media. So there is um, potential to be improved when it comes to the warning system and that a transfer of information is important. It is important to get the information to the final user. And that is something which is, as it seems, uh, lacking uh, in the whole region. It could be improved. Thank you very much. There was a comment in the uh, in the Q and A, that uh, health was not included in municipalities' uh, climate action plans, uh, which brings me to to a policy question uh, that I would have uh, to you, Daniela, as you presented several um, important initiatives: the low carbon uh, um, strategy, the uh, EU accession process, the national energy and climate plans. Uh, if if I was a doctor or you know somebody from the public concerned about climate change, what's your recommendation? Which one should I uh, be active on? Or are they all, I mean, are they all important? But is there something in the next uh, weeks and months that we from the health community could be active on specifically? When it comes to the health sector, 
is also important because they are defining one goal up to um, 2050 as an integrated action plan. They are uh, only for sector of energy by 2030, but we cannot choose the best option. And the best option means the most uh, cost-effective option. If in any sense we do not uh, consider the benefits for the health system, but the fact is that this is not being done. Unfortunately, I'm not sure. If you take a look at the EU, a key, what they are looking for, for these integrated plan for climate and energy, there is no health section there. But generally, I think that what's very important is the strategy, climate strategy, which has been done, but it simply disappeared. It's somewhere, but the moment it appears, if it appears, there is a huge space for that. But the health sector uh, lacks a serious impact analysis for the impact of climate on health. Why shouldn't we have part of the process referring to climate change and health, which is which was not the case so far, and this is being done for Europe? And why wasn't it the case? Because it's not only that there is you no know, readiness of uh, ministries or individuals to take part in that, but because, as Maria said, there is a lack of systematic data or uh, un uh, unaccessible data. So I think that this is something that should uh, put pressure. I think that we should uh, say that health should be part of every document dealing with any kind of pollution, especially uh, with the aspects of uh, climate changes. Not only directly, but when you talk about the impacts only through uh, heat, waves, heat waves, that's not realistic. Water, food, the long-term consequences uh, to health, these are very important uh, aspects for the health sector and for the promotion of that as additional value uh, towards adaptation and mitigation. But the strategy is such, and uh, we sh the law on climate change should start uh, with the impl implementation uh, here in Serbia. And uh, I think that the health sector should ask a question. Okay, let's see, where is this implementation concerning the climate change? And I'm, I claim that there is this basis the, the, uh, in all the countries uh, that have this in their legislation. Yes, I would also like to add that I agree with Daniela that there, this could be a trap if we only record direct uh, consequences of climate change. And if we don't uh, count in the external things like uh, agriculture, like water resources, like uh, forestry and so on. So as indirect uh, consequences, so one good thing about climate change is we should see as our opportunity. We say health in all policies, in all sectors, we should have representation of health. And the climate change should, in a way, consolidate all sectors. On the other hand, one very important thing with climate change, they don't know boundaries, the same as air pollution. And having in mind these joint uh, challenges in the Western Balkans and having in mind that we are all relatively small countries, then it is necessary to consolidate in terms of monitoring and that is cheaper and more efficient in a long run for all uh, in order to get better results. Uh, as for the record keeping uh, and data in the uh, health sector, I've mentioned this in my presentation because of the lack of time, I did not have, uh, didn't elaborate on this, but there must be a procedure that will, uh, the same as they are forcing a physician to keep track of some contagious diseases. So also in the system, we should 
uh, keep track of the heat waves and that should be systemic monitoring so far this is not uh, done in this way and we are more vulnerable as i said and less resilient than the rest of uh, the world or the rest of the European Union. I'm just saying that, but maybe this is our, our chance to give our contribution uh, by working in this region. Thank you. Uh, Francis, uh, oh, go ahead. May I just add something? I think that what Maria just said is very important. Everything that is adaptation to climate change and everything that represents health, but water and agriculture as well. This regional approach is very important. The Western Nile virus will not remain only in Montenegro or uh, Serbia. So this is a good uh, opportunity for regional approach that could uh, provide answers in a quicker way and to put pressure where it should in order to get some reaction from the aspect of health when we talk about the governments and policies and specific actions. I'm sorry for occupying your, your time, but this was a good point to make. So Thank you, indeed. Say. Very important point about the, the need to cooperation. And Francis, I wanted to, to turn to you as, as you highlighted in your presentation, um, uh, the urgency to act. Uh, and as we're moving towards a key moment uh, in terms of assessing how the countries are doing uh, in, you know, in that urgency to act with the COP26 later this year, um, I wanted to ask you if you could uh, give our participants, uh, you know, a, some some understanding of the importance of the COP and what, uh, you know, um, participants here from the Western Balkans regions, how they can be involved in activities to prepare the COP. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um I've been to a few COP meetings in the past. Um, this is a this is an important one. Uh, the cycle with the COP meetings is that there tends to be a, a key important meeting where big decisions end up being made. So like the Paris Accord, the 2015 meeting. And then it's a little bit quiet for a few years while countries work out what it all means and try to sort of move the process forward. And then you have another what is described as a ratchet meeting, which is a meeting that puts the pressure on again to try and drive things forward. So COP26 is seen as a ratchet meeting, uh, which is one to sort of push the whole thing forward a bit faster and with a bit more urgency. Um, it's in Glasgow in the UK. So I'm particularly attuned to it at the moment because I'm based in the UK. I actually live in Manchester. Uh, so, uh, well, no, I don't live in Manchester. I live between Manchester and Leeds which is the Pennines in between. Anyway, halfway between London and Glasgow. So there's a lot of uh, media attention on the COP meeting this year. Um, and climate change is probably in the news here. You know, every other day or so, it really is high in the media agenda as, as the UK is the host for the meeting. So there's a lot of activity. Um, the, the sort of... The frustration with the COP process, the international process, is it is hard for it to move as quickly as those of us who study or engage in the process want it to move. And partly that's because there's 195 plus countries involved and they've all got to agree on the next steps. And that's a really complicated process, actually, to get that agreement because people are coming from such different places and levels, different levels of development um, and, and different industries. That are, that are at risk by taking um, action on climate change and, and moving from fossil fuels to renewables. So there's all this sort of, um, if you like, peaceful conflict within the process, which is what the United Nations is all about, trying to find peaceful ways forward to solve some of our biggest problems. But climate change really is our biggest problem, along with uh, biodiversity loss. And so far, the international process has taken us quite a long way, but we do need to speed up. And that that is really what the next 10 years is about, it's trying to get that international process to speed up. And, and that can only really happen, I think, if nations start to pick up that activity and increase the amount of investment in research, but particularly in translation from research into policy development and policy implementation, whilst taking everybody with those policy changes. So improving public support and understanding about climate change and involvement and engagement. So there's a lot to do. Um, and we've got this decade to, to start on that road. But 
but I think there is a general sort of recognition and, and enthusiasm for aiming for net zero. Not as far away as 2050. Everybody is now beginning to say, can we do it quickly, more quickly? Could it be 2040? Can it be 2035? The important thing is we're moving in the right direction. We've just got to do it more quickly. Thank you. And do you have anything specific for, for the health community from the Western Balkans, how they can be active? Well, I think it's been really interesting hearing about um, the Western Balkans experiences with heat waves in particular. And I am actually wondering, I'd like to connect after this meeting to see um, whether, first of all, whether we have any data within the countdown that we've been looking at on heat. And I don't have an answer to that. I, I don't think we have, because I know we have been looking at um, green space. Uh, but I will take this back to the team and, and see uh, whether there's a, a, a place here where we could um, access more data and share that data. It might not be possible to do that for this year's report, but it might be a question of building it into future work. And for health professionals, I think really um, try and understand the science of, you know, a little bit more, maybe look at a Lancet Countdown report, maybe look at a policy briefing specifically for the region. So say the European policy briefing, it's on the website, um, fairly easy to find if you dig around for a bit and, and, and start to understand the issue a little bit more, the science and the health impacts. And then think about where you might be able to get involved. So for public health departments, very much about adaptation plans, early warning systems as have been mentioned, um, sharing information, public communication around climate change and health. There's a lot of different ways. I think the question is picking the right one and having some investment to drive it forward. Thank you very much. And with that, we've actually reached the end of our webinar. I'm glad that we already identified some uh, possible follow-up uh, in what we very much hope is the beginning of a conversation with all of you uh, for, you know, bringing up uh, this issue of climate change and health and the need to protect our health, as well as the benefits, the huge benefits we would see from, from mitigation action uh, in the region and beyond. And with that, I wanted to close this meeting by thanking, giving some thanks. Um, I hope you can see it. And I just have to, sorry. Right. So first of all, I wanted to, of course, thank you um, to our excellent speakers. You've had very rich presentations and contributions. It's been a pleasure listening to you and talking to you this afternoon. So thank you, Francis. Thank you, Daniela. And thank you, Maria. I also would like to thank our uh, translators here this afternoon, Sanya and Nives. Thank you so much. Without you, we couldn't do this and have this kind of exchange and really look across the region and you know beyond the region uh, in, in our conversation this afternoon. And for those of you who are interested in continuing to be part of the discussion, next Tuesday is the opportunity as we're organizing the next webinar, this time on the Green Agenda for the Balkans and Healthy Recovery. That was already briefly mentioned today and next week is your opportunity to find out more and see what kind of opportunities there are to become active. And with that, I would like to close the webinar. Thank you all again and wish you a good rest of the day. Bye bye.